Welcome everyone um, to the um, joint meeting of the African Society of Human Genetics, the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics, and um, H3Africa. I hope you've had an interesting past couple of days, and um, we really welcome you to the day today. I, my name is um, Julie Makani, and um, I am from Tanzania. Currently, I'm in um, South Africa, Johannesburg, and um, I will be chairing this session with Professor Christian Happy from um, Nigeria. So with that, um, I would like to welcome um, the first speaker. Um, welcome, Dr. Siana. Warm greetings from Tanzania. My name is Dr. Siana Nk. I am the president of the Tanzania Human Genetics Organization. Guest of Anna, Honorable Minister of Health, Social Welfare, Elderly, Gender and Children in Zanzibar, representative of the Honorable former President Dr. Jakaya Mrisho Kikwete, Honorable Ambassador Togulani Mavura, the African Society of Human Genetics Board, Human Heredity and Health in Africa, H3 Africa, Tanzania Human Genetics Organization Board, our beloved sponsors, including 54 Gene in Kaba and Illumina, the organizing committee of the 13th Conference of the Africa Society of Human Genetics and the 18th meeting of the H3 Africa, beloved participants in Tanzania, Africa, and globally. I would first like to express my gratitude to the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to deliver a welcome note in this important event to our country, Tanzania, Africa, and the international communities. Since its inauguration in 2003, the African Society of Human Genetics has cultivated a culture of conducting annual conferences each year in alternative African countries. The overall aim of these meetings have been to strengthen human genetics activities in these respective countries and to bring together scientists across Africa in order to share expertise, experience, skills, and knowledge, as well as building meaningful networks. This year's conference is organized by the Tanzania Human Genetics Organization as the local host, the African Society of Human Genetics, and the Human Heredity and Health in Africa, H3 Africa. The Tanzania Human Genetics Organization was founded in 2017 launched in 2019 and formally registered in 2021 with the overall mission of coordinating and enhancing human genetics research services and related activities in the community in order to generate knowledge and recommendations for the prevention diagnosis and treatment of genetic diseases as well as promoting health in tanzania since the conception of the society, we had a dream of hosting the annual Africa Society of Human Genetics meeting in our country for the first time in the history of our nation. We knew that hosting this event will be a catalyst of the, the ongoing efforts of enhancing human genetics activities in the country. On behalf of the Tanzania Human Genetics Organization, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the African Society of Human Genetics Board, being led by Professor Ambrose Wonkam, for giving us and our country a chance to make history in the book of human genetics journey in Africa. The experience of organizing this event initially as a physical meeting and then visual has given us a chance to grow significantly and to learn from all of you. We know that this year's conference is different since we are not able to interact in person. We in Tanzania really looked forward to have received all of you in our country and share with you the warmth of the people of Tanzania. Living in the world of COVID-19 is teaching us new ways of overcoming the norm as we are forced to adapt to new ways of living, including the way we conduct our meetings. We are fortunate for the technological advancements that are still allowing us 
to continue pursuing our dreams, including networking and knowledge sharing. I am confident that we can still use the available technologies, such as the one we have for this meeting, to still learn from one another and build the meaningful networks that we wanted. Tanzania was identified as an ideal place to host discussions of genetics of African populations, as East Africa is believed to harbor most of the genetic diversity on the continent. We hope that through this meeting, we will learn about the increasing engagement of modern genomic technologies in an African context with explicit discussions of how it can be translated to the clinic in the present or near future. We, know, we all know that Africa is still lagging behind in human genetics research, diagnosis, training and advocacy, and on how all of this can be applied to improve the health of the people of Africa. The theme of this year's conference is genomics and translational research to improve health in Africa. The talks and sessions of this meeting are planned to discuss, including but not limited to genomic medicine, pharmacogenomics, bioinformatics, and DNA diagnostics for both common and rare genetic disorders. Although hurdles exist in incorporating such topics into clinical care in Africa, having these dialogues will lead to incorporating the use of genetic information as it becomes more cost effective. In addition, with the rapidly decreasing costs of whole exome and whole genome sequencing, research in Africa can be at the forefront of finding new variants that play a role in risk of disease, given the diversity of population structure in the continent. We hope that this conference will be a catalyst in pushing the human genetics agenda in Africa and to ensure that Africa, just as other developed continents, realize the benefits of genomics translation in improving the health of the people of Africa. We believe that genomics in Africa will impact in diagnosing and quick diagnosis of rare and common diseases, will inform us on how diseases are distributed across the continent, will give us knowledge on how differently disease progress from one person to another, as well as how people respond to treatment. All of these are known to contribute greatly in improving the health of the people as we move forward the agenda of precision or personalized medicine. With these words, I wish you a fruitful conference and I hope that by the end of this conference, each one of us would have learned something new as well as make new connections. On behalf of the organizing committee, I welcome you to this important event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Siana. Um, I didn't um, introduce Dr. Siana properly. Dr. Siana is the president of um, the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics. She and um, Mohamed Zahir, um, who is also um, on um, one of the organizers, co-founded the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics. And this is after they met at a meeting, at the last meeting of the African Society of Human Genetics. So um, when they started discussing setting up um, the, the Tanzania Society, one of the things that I, um, um, I kind of um, cautioned them about was how important it was for them to continue with um, their scientific um, careers, as well as um, participating in, in, in activities in um, organizing meetings. And I have to uh, mention a few of the achievements that Dr. Siana, um, and um, Mohamed Zahir and, 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 and their colleagues have been able to do. Siana has been able to um, get a, a K43 NIH award. Uh, she has also been able to um, very recently um, received a grant from um, Novartis to look at um, hydroxyurea and um, precision medicine. Dr. Mohamed Zahir um, and, and colleagues organized the first gene editing um, workshop um, on sickle cell disease that was held in June 2020 last year. 
and he's also working on looking at um, hematopoietic stem cells and um, he's looking for funding and we're very optimistic that we've been able to receive some initial funding so that we can start um, preparing Tanzania and other countries such as Uganda to participate in gene therapy trials. And this they have been able to do whilst they've been setting up um, the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics, organizing this meeting, um, setting up um, a, a, a partnership with 54Gene and um, with, um, led by Des, Professor Delsi Shengoma and really being at the forefront of pushing all the um, areas that, that we are all very passionate about. So much, much, um, and many, many congratulations from Dr. Siana Nke, to Dr. Siana Nke and um, Mohamed Zahir, as well as the Tanzanian Society of Human Genetics. Um, I think now I would like to welcome um, Professor Ambrose Wonkam. He has, um, because he is absolutely amazing, he has been able to, um, he is currently the president of um, the African Society of Human Genetics, as well as being um, the chair of the principal investigators and steering committee of H3 Africa, as well as being um, PI on several projects, including um, the Sickle Pan-African um, Data Coordinating mm -hmm. Center, mm -hmm. SADAC, which is part of Sickle in Africa. So um, with all those very few hats that I've mentioned, and Ambrose has a lot more. I'd like um, to welcome Professor Ambrose Wonkam to say a few words. Welcome, Ambrose. Yeah, thank you very much, Sister Julie, for the kind introduction. And uh, my gratitude to Siana and to Mohammed to uh, take the lead to organize this meeting in Tanzania. We know by experience that this is not a easy task and you have done so well, despite the challenges of moving the meeting from a face to face or in person to an online platform. What Julie haven't said is that actually Sienna is a mentee of Julie. Um, I can say for a fact because I was part of the examiner at the time, uh, which also means that um, capacity development on the continent with African by African is happening and, and on a very efficient way. My name is Amhuas Wonkam. I'm a medical geneticist by training. I'm a genetically from Cameroon, uh, professionally from Cape Town. I'm professor of human genetics at the University of Cape Town. I will be speaking on behalf of the colleague of the African Society of Human Genetics and to some extent of History Africa Consortium. Uh, the African Society ASEAN officially started in 2003, but actually in 2001. Uh, at the first inaugural meeting happened in Washington under the leadership of Professor Charles Rutimi. Uh, it is the place to thank him because it's the proof that brain drain do not drain forever, but they can actually circulate. And coming back on Africa was in 2003 in Ghana. And since then, the society have organized meetings in numerous countries in Africa. And every single time we land in a specific place, we take the opportunity uh, to enhance the development of human genetic through the creation of society. That's the way uh, the Gandes Cameroonian society was created, the Malian society, uh, and today the, the Rwandan society, the Senegalese society of human genetics, and the Tanzanian society. And uh, we will be having our next meeting next year or the 18 months from now in Morocco, the Moroccan Society of Human Genetics. So clearly the society has been a strong vehicle for networking and to connect Africa uh, with themselves and using genetic and a vehicle for health and for research uh, within Africa. For this specific meeting, we have nearly 400 people that registered. We had uh, about 30, uh, 49 fellow that applied to present and 22 of them were selected for formal uh, presentation. Uh, the uh, registrant uh, came from uh, 38 countries and many countries out of Africa, including China, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, from countries in Europe and in America. So we are very uh, proud to uh, continue using our convening power as a society uh, to uh, link Africa uh, to the global world for human genetics. It is the time to uh, acknowledge uh, our partner, the Tanzanian Society as the local host and the H3 Africa Consortium 
our industry partner, traditional partner like Inkaba, the new one uh, like 54 jeans. Our part founder partner, the NIH that have been supporting our meeting for a very long time and the Welcome Trust. And also uh, the new coming uh, in the partnership with us uh, from the editorial houses, the Lancet House, specifically the Lancet Hematology uh, with uh, the session that will start very soon. And also the Nature House, specifically with the Nature Genetics with whom we want to build a long-term collaboration starting with supporting our young fellow of the meeting today. So I'm very grateful for all the attendees today, and we hope you will have a fruitful meeting in the next three days. Thank you very much. Uh, Julie, over to you. Thank you very much, Ambrose. So um, I was just sending a message to Chris, um, and he says he's in the meeting room. So, um, so I am delighted to introduce and to welcome um, Professor Christian Happy. Um, as Ambrose has said, Professor Christian Happy um, introduced himself. Christian Happy is um, genetically from Cameroon and um, professionally in Nigeria. He uh, is immediate past um, chair of the um, PI steering committee meeting um, or committee of H3 Africa. He is a, a global leader in, in genomics, um, particularly pathogen genomics. And um, it's a pleasure to welcome um, Professor Christian Happy to speak on behalf of H3 Africa. Welcome, Chris. No problem. Um, so one of the things, um, whilst we're waiting for Chris, let's see if I can um, bring up his, um, read his, uh, the work that he's done. So Christian, um, yeah, I have it here. Just give me, um, let me know when he's he's here. So Christian Happy trained in um, Harvard and he's professor of molecular biology and genomics and um, um, the director of um, the World Bank funded African Center of Excellence for genomics and um, infectious disease. It's known as ACEGID. This is based at Rediba's University in Nigeria. His main focus of research is in genomics of infectious disease, and he has contributed significantly to what is known and available today as the circulating variants, pathogenesis, and rapid diagnosis of Lassa fever and other emerging infectious diseases in Africa. He and, and colleagues in, in Nigeria were one of the first um, groups, if not the first group in Africa, to publish um, the, the genome um, the viral genome of SARS-CoV-2 um, in, in Nigeria, and this was last year. We, um, and when I say we, this is um, H3 Africa, um, Sickle in Africa, held a, a, a workshop in, um, and this was virtually just at the beginning of um, the COVID pandemic. And I think um, Jen Troyer and others from NHGR, NHGRI at the NIH um, will remember the kind of shock that we had when we had our first um, um, COVID-19 meeting um, hacked and we had to postpone that Zoom um, workshop and have it. And Chris Ambrose, um, Lucio Luzato, as, um, as well as um, Biri and Mariam spoke at this meeting and it's available on, on the Sickle in Africa YouTube channel that's run by Dr. Vicky Nembawara. So um, Chris, um, is a member of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine in the UK. He's also a member of the African Academy of Science, and um, he's a senior associate member of the Broad Institute of both um, Harvard and MIT, and he's a visiting professor um, at Harvard University in the US. So Chris, I was just um, singing your praises. Um, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, sorry for this um, technical glitch. Uh, again, Julie, is always a privilege I mean, to be introduced uh, by someone like you. As I said, you shoe such a big shoe and then the impact you make in Tanzania and especially has always been, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm this person that I always tell all the young um, uh, female African scientists that I have a sister somewhere in Tanzania and then she should be that inspiring figure for many of you. So I, I, it's a real pleasure to be here and then see how you're driving the, the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics. And then uh, I need to seek the permission of Ambrose, my, my brother Ambrose, to present 
you know, on behalf of H3 Africa, because um, uh, uh, I ceased to be the, ch the chair of the steering committee uh, about a few days ago, and Ambrose is the one on the driving seat. I think with his permission, tells me, then I can go on and then do give this welcome address. I guess the way the program was designed, it was still thought that I was going to be the chair at this moment. I think if Ambrose give me the permission, then I can go ahead and then do that. So that, I mean, on his behalf, and then on behalf of H3 Africa. Ambrose, go ahead. Go okay, ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ambrose, please switch your um, Ambrose, please switch your microphone, um, your camera on. Thank you, Ambrose. Okay, so I think with the permission of the chair of the steering committee, the present chair, I think with you, I mean, with existing protocol, Ambrose has given me the permission to present on behalf of H3 Africa and on his behalf in this case, uh, because he's actually the the present chair of the committee. And then um, let me get on and then share the screen. Okay, so if I could go on and then um, share the screen, let me just see what pops up here. Um, I don't know what is being seen here because this is the screen I want you guys to see. Okay, slideshow. So um, again, I want to uh, thank everyone for the presentation, and I want to want to welcome everyone uh, at this meeting. And then I will talk to the and then present. I mean, uh, as you know, um, uh, this is the 18. I mean, this meeting of the African Society of Human Genetics and the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics is a joint meeting with the 18. A3 Africa Consortium meeting. And it is a fourth joint meeting between you know, H3 Africa and then a uh, fourth joint meeting between H3 Africa and the African Society of Human Genetics. The first was in Johannesburg in 2013. Then we had one in Dakar 2016 and then one in Kigali. So we could not do one, I mean, last year because of the present pandemic situation. And then Julia alluded to it. So and then uh, we had to postpone. And uh, uh, thankfully, at least there's some progress, at least we can still do it virtually. I would thank God we're all here to witness this great occasion. And, and, and then the great organization put in place by H3 Africa and then the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics. And I really want to congratulate all of the organizers, uh, Sienna, uh, Julie, and a many others that I don't have know the name, but who have made this happen. And we're really proud of the fact that, you know, this society I mean, in Tanzania, is really making great stride as part of sickle cell and many that are, uh, many other research that I'm aware of. So, and for I mean, for H3 Africa, we're in the ninth year of the of this program, and I mean, uh, we we started in 20, in 2012 and in Addis Ababa. We still have a year to go, and then H3 Africa as a, as a consortium has really uh, helped a lot and has delivered a lot on the continent. I want to use this opportunity to thank you know. Others, every other, I mean, everybody that has contributed to H3 Africa. I can't name all everybody here, but I will just go on and then thank the funders that is NIH, NAGRI, the Africa Academy of Science, Wellcome Trust, and then other funders. And then uh, the, the array of special guests, you know, that have spoken, you know, I mean, at the beginning of the meeting and that have spoken in the previous meeting and that will be speaking also in the, in the, next, in, in the next few days of this meeting. Also, I want to use the opportunity to chair to, to to thank you know the external um, the the the, I, the IEC you know and then that is chaired by Barry Bloom and then K, and, and then K Davis you know for all the support that they've given you know um, the the the, the H three Africa Consortium. I will also want to seize the opportunity to thank uh, Professor King Abayomi, uh, who is the chair of the DBAC, and all the PIs and then the fellows and then the administrators, the program managers of all the project, as well as you know the coordinating center led by Michelle Skelton for the incredible work that they've done over the years in order to support you know, the H3 Africa Consortium and made it what it is today. So to give some highlights you know, of the um, uh, 18 you know, H3 Africa meeting consortium. So I think in the past week, you know, the working groups were on and then they actually came the first day and then gave us some report back and that was very interesting to hear from the various group, you know, uh, the working various working group reporting, and we also had like guest speakers from we had um, uh, 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 Professor Rekism, you know, talking to us, and then uh, we have um, a speaker from the HPRC, from WHO, 
um, and then also from HCA and then Corrib. So we had an array of speakers speaking in the past few days. We also heard a lot of great research from the PIs and the fellows. And that really, I mean, um, I was very thrilled to see exactly what has been made since the beginning of history Africa and now because we could see many fellows really speaking boldly and very eloquently about what the kind of, the kind of work that they've done. And there was a very interesting session, you know, I mean, very interesting session about, I mean, where we listened to early career scientists, you know, and really, you know, looked, at, looked up to the five top achievers, you know, that, I mean, that, that were able to deliver about 10 plenary speeches. I mean, and then also we had 20 speed presentation in the, in the meeting. You know, on the, on, on the 2nd of September, which was, I mean, which is <clears throat> today, then we have this joint, you know, meeting with uh, H3 Africa and then the, uh, the Africa Study of Human Genetics. And what I want to really mention here, the Lancet Dermatology, you know, Sickle Cell Disease in Africa launch, so which really makes, again, this day very unique in many ways. And then many of uh, many themes in the sessions of today will include H3 Africa PIs, as you see, between you know um, H3 Africa and 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 and, and the, the Africa Society is mingled because most PIs in the two societies or the two two I mean the the the, the two consortia you know are are, are pretty much walking hand in hand. And really today, I mean, going along, we also have a lot of networking, social events and exhibitions, and then also, you know, COVID-19 memorials. So I think to just present some history of Africa progress at glance is, um, I mean, you could see it here. For instance, you could see that, you know, within, in terms of membership, you know, you could see that, you know, the membership of the society has grown, I mean, it grown a lot. It went in the between 2018 to 2019, it actually grew about two, three, four. In terms of trainees, it was almost almost twofold increase, and then trainee support, you know, more than twofold increase. In terms of publication, so we, we almost you know threefold increase in terms of publication, and that's very impressive to see. And most of these publications are African led. Now, what is very super impressive here is the fact that the number of participants recruited in the H3 Africa program, I mean, in the H3 Africa Consortium research. We went from 50,000, you know, in 2018 to double these numbers in three years, from 50,000 to 100,000. That is impressive. And this really actually paved the way for sustainability for this um, consortium, you know. And then here we are in terms of uh, thinking about how we can basically sustain this. And then the, 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 the consortium has generated a lot in terms of access, knowledge, and then solution. We're going to see that in the next few slides. For instance, in terms of participants, as we mentioned, we had over 100,000, but this was anticipated. We anticipated to do 112,000, but we still have a year left, and we're already at 107,000. Most likely, we're going to be above this number as it has happened. So in terms of the Africa rate, it was anticipated we're going to use about 6,000, but we're about to way above it, over 30,000 areas used. And you can see here, and even in terms of NGS targeted, so it wasn't anticipated to do within the consortium over 400. And more impressive is actually the fact that there are over 15,000 RNA sick, and none of these were, I mean, this was not anticipated originally. So, and in t I mean, then in terms of a real asset, you know, I, mean, I think Africa, actually Africa has a unique asset because we have like eight studies now and over that have generated over 20 data set. And then we have in our bio repositories, you know, over 23,000, you know, bio specimens. And these bio repositories actually represent, I think, the way for the future studies in Africa. And they really want here to really acknowledge, you know, a large day with our, with our, our in the Institute of Human Biology in Nigeria. Then we have the um, IBR H3AU in uh, University of Macquarie and then CLS, you know, University of Witchwater Strand. Strength. So these are about repository that actually are holding up a lot of uh, useful, you know, and then um, a great specimen that could be very important for, you know, on the continent. I also want to highlight a few countries that significantly is specimen. And, and that really is, is, I mean, is important to mention here. We have the trypanogen, and then we have the siren study, we have a H3 Africa chip, and then the calf gen and origin by Michelle, I mean, Michelle, and then that's really 
have been tremendous in terms of making this information and then the data available and then maybe um, uh, that will be useful in the future so and then there are many other studies in the pipeline and then cross and a few of them are in the repeats uh, studies and then these are studies that are already using existing as uh, the existing sequence data that are already available but then there are also some other studies that will be probably uh, will be coming on along along and this uh, these are the uh, transcriptome and the blood trait for this study they will need you know to generate additional data phenotype and then also once uh, we have this then access can be we can i mean uh, people can have access but then there are also studies that are very specific to disease like rare disease and other infectious disease and many other diseases across the continent you target that are mixtures kind of selection across you know uh, different population across africa so and this uh, really um to achieve this there's a need actually to look at i mean to generate additional data or more data harmonize the way this data i mean harmonize this data and then also make access but as you take all of these things together actually show that there is opportunity here for not only excellent research in the future but there's also opportunity for training then visibility and then also sustainability and that um i, I think it's uh, important at this point to actually mention a few of the things that actually made Africa and HR Africa has made a huge slash um, uh, what in, in, in genomics and in the field of science and we cannot talk about HR Africa without talking about this major paper and it's this major market paper that occurred I mean that uh, that was published last year whereby we had you know um, and this paper published in nature actually provided one of the most you know, extensive studies ever done in the African population, and that really uncovered millions of new genetic variants, you know, and that really provides a better and a new insight into the diversity and the history of the African continent and its people. I think H3 Africa, through, I mean, through the consortium, has brought Africa science to a new level. And really, we're very glad, you know, that this has really changed the paradigm and then changed the dynamic. Then in the field of you know infectious disease, so uh, here I am receiving this award, but this was really built around the fact economics, you know, I need to put Africa on the map and then to guide the public health response to COVID in a way that was unanticipated in the past. Remember that we actually generated the first task two in Africa hours of receiving the sample. And then the group in South Africa and many other places in the continent identified new variants way before others could do. And that's really guiding Africa and then using this data for public health response in a way that was unprecedented. So really going on, I mean, I think H3 Africa has made great, great interest. And then one thing that I want to mention here and actually to show that, you know, H3 Africa has transformed, you know, I mean, what I call the youth of Africa. This is a case of Shagun Fatimo. And this is a real story that should be inspiring many young people across the continent. This is a young man that was a, you know, and signed and through the H3 Africa platform has, you know, have become one of the greatest genome scientists in the world. And we believe that, you know, such stories should be more inspiring for the young generation coming up and realize that and, and show people that it is possible given the platform. I really want to use the opportunity to, 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 to thank Michelle Ramsey for, you know, the leadership that she's actually provided, you know, in the field and then leading these great innovations and then papers and then making sure that Africa is highly represented, you know, in the field of uh, human genomics. Again, saying thank you to Ambrose. You know, as Julie mentioned, we are all from the same genetic background. We're coming from the same, uh, and I'm just hand over to him. There's no other better person than to hand over the H3 Africa Consortium. Knowing how Ambrose is passionate about H3 Africa and the African Society of Human, Gen and Human Genetics, at least I cannot just but be so proud and glad of the fact that now we have all of these two entities in the, in the hands of a hero and then in the hand of somebody that believes so much in Africa and in its potential. And Ambrose, I am very sure, you know, as uh, he has demonstrated always in the past, that he's capable of, you know, leading us to a new level, you know, and uh, to, um, as far as the Africa society and the history of Africa is concerned. So on this note, I really want to thank you. And then again, for those who, that who weren't there, you know, during the H3 Africa steering meeting uh, start, I want to really uh, welcome Ambrose as the new chair of the, of the H3 Africa consortium and Ambrose who will be assisted in his own, in this task with uh, Zane Lombardi, Zane Lombardi, who was uh, uh, voted in as a co-chair. 
And uh, Ambrose, again, you know, I am so proud and glad to hand over the baton to you. And I know very well that you're going to take it, you know, to a different level because you have more capacity than many of us, you know, do have. Uh, again, thank you uh, to, to everyone for this meeting. And then we, I'm very sure that in the next few days, we're going to be having a, you know, a meeting ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. That was fantastic. Really, really a lot of congratulations to H3 Africa. What has been achieved over the past 11 years is absolutely extraordinary. And um, so congratulations to everyone. And um, thank you to the funders, NIH Wellcome Trust, as well as the other funders that are funding um, indirectly the scientists, as well as um, the, the infrastructure of the investigators in Africa. So thank you very, very much. Um, and now we'll um, go back to the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics. And um, I would like to welcome um, Dr. Siana Nkia or um, Mohamed Zahir to um, welcome the um, dignitaries from the government officials who have um, honored us to be part of this. Um, whilst um, we're waiting for the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics to um, start the introductions, I just want to um, say a special thank you to Ambassador Togolani Mavura. He has been really supportive of um, the setup and the um, establishment of the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics, as well as the Ali Kimara Foundation for Rare Disease. And it really makes a big difference having high um, level support, high level advocacy from um, yourself, um, Ambassador Togolani. Um, Ambassador Dr. Togolani previous, uh, worked for the previous president of um, the United Republic of Tanzania, um, President Jakai Kikwete, and um, he has been really instrumental in, in, in um, supporting and getting support um, to the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics. Um, are, you, are, you, are we ready, Tanzania Society? Thank you. Welcome. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Welcome. Yes, okay. yes, that was yes, 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 that was yes, 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 yes, that authorities in Tanzania because they have been extremely supportive of research um, from the setup of, of um, human genetics, from the setup of genomic research in Tanzania, the setup of the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics, really trying to look at the establishment of um, capacity, both for human genetics as well as pathogen genetics. And um, this is from the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of um, Education, Science and Technology, and also when we have um, been trying to um, organize um, high level meetings, whether this is at the World Bank or at the UN General Assembly, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has also been extremely, extremely uh, supportive. And then beyond that, as, 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 as I've mentioned with Ambassador um, Togolani, we have also had high level um, support from the Office of the President and the Office of the Vice President. So this is uh, from President Kikwete, President Magufuli, and now President Samia, who, when she was the Vice President um, of Tanzania in, in last year, she uh, attended the, I think, it, yes, it was last year. Um, she, she, she was the um, guest of honor at um, the rare disease um, day. So we really have been lucky in Tanzania in getting high level um, advocacy and high, high level support. Um, Siana, Dr. Siana, are you ready? Yes, Prof. So thank you so much. Good afternoon again from Tanzania, warm greetings. Um, just to say that we in Tanzania also had a local hub where we have um, about 60 or 50 people together. And we are, we are very grateful to have with us our guest of honor, the Minister of Health, Social Welfare, Gender, Elderly and Children. I hope I've made the order correctly mm -hmm. with us. Um, and we really thank him for the support that he has shown to us 
to be joining us, not just visually, but in person in Dar es Salaam. Um, we also have with us um, Honorable Ambassador Togolani Mavura, who is representing the former president, Yakaya Mgrisho Kikwete. With these words, I would first like to welcome the speech from the former president, Yakaya Mgrisho Kikwete, which will be followed by the speech from the guest of honor. Thank you. Standing here on behalf of His Excellency Dr. Jakai Ambrisho Kikwete, former President of the United Republic of Tanzania and a formidable champion of human genomics. President Kikwete wished to address this conference in person. However, due to exigencies of office, he could not do so uh, this time. He is outside the country and asked me to stand on his behalf and deliver his short remarks as follows. So, Honorable Nasor Mazrui, Minister of Health, Social Welfare, Elderly, Gender and Children from Zanzibar, the Board of the Africa Society of Human Genetics, Human Heredity and Health in Africa, Madam President, Tanzania Society of Human Genetics, and the Board, the Organizing Committee, beloved participants in Tanzania, Africa, and globally, ladies and gentlemen. I'm grateful to the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics, the African Society of Human Genetics, and the Human Heredity for Africa for organizing this important conference and inviting me to take part. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all participants around the globe who have dedicated their time to take part in this historic meeting. It is unfortunate that we could not meet physically as it is accustomed due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We hope that this situation will get back normal very soon and we shall be happy and free to meet and interact physically. Our country and many others in Africa still experience a great burden of both communicable and uncommunicable diseases which also impact the socio-economic development of individual countries and the entire continent. We now also understand that genetic patterns plays a great role in defining disease prevalence, distribution, vulnerability, progression, and treatment outcomes. We also know that African continent is still lagging behind in terms of human genetics research and development of DNA diagnostic despite the high genetic diversity posed by the people of this continent. We understand that the building the genetics capacity in Africa will not only impact the Africans, but the whole world, because all other human race are believed to have come out of Africa. Looking at the theme of this conference, genomics and translational research to improve health in Africa, and the coverage of different topics, I'm confident that you'll have a great discussions and deliberations which will be fruitful. It is my sincere hope that this conference will result into long-term future networks and partnerships that will impact the health of the Africans. I wish you all the best and fruitful deliberations. Thank you. I'm Nasser Ahmed Mazrui, Minister for Health, Social Welfare, Elders, Gender and Children, Zanzibar. I'm delighted to participate on this 13th Conference of African Society of Human Genetics. This is very important event which bring 300 diverse participants from both ASSHG and the H3 Africa. The theme of this conference is very interesting. The theme is genomics and translation research to improve health in Africa. This conference will be discussing on the concept, challenges, opportunities, and the development in African genetics. Tanzania and many other African countries are working hard with controllable infectious disease with enormous toll on lives of our people and social economical development of individual people, countries, and entire continents. Increased trend of non-communicable disease is overwhelming. To fight this disease and ch the challenges they impose on our communities, it is critical and urgent to invest in innovative methods, including those focusing on human genetics in areas such as basic and applied science, operation and implementation research services delivery, and technological advancement. As a government, we shall take a lead to strengthen local capacity for research and development towards discovery 
optimization deployment of effective interventions. Our government will fully support the activities and the techniques to make the, the deliberation of this conference very successful. We are greatly honored and privileged to meet with scientists and researchers from African continent to exchange views and ideas which will bring ways and means to combat our challenges facing health sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And I wish you all the best on this important event. Thank you very, very much, Honorable Minister of um, Health in Zanzibar, um, Tanzania. Thank you very much for that. Um, we have, um, it is now one o'clock and we are actually running um, ahead of time. Um, so I will take this time to do a couple of things. The first is, um, is to mention um, three things um, that I feel are worth mentioning. Um, and one is, is really to, to recognize um, the, the, the role that uh, Professor Bongani Mayosi had in H3 Africa, the African Society of Human Genetics, and really supporting the development of um, excellence in science and scientists in Africa. Um, Professor Bongani Mayosi um, um, passed away and a lot of the work and the ethos that is driving H3 Africa is really um, something that he really believed in and really wants us to spend a minute um, just um, recognizing um, the, 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 the role that Bongani Mayosi had in, in, in this work that we are all doing. Next, I'd really would like to thank again um, the guest of honors from Tanzania, Ambassador Togolani, on behalf of uh, President Jakaya Mrisho Kikwete, and um, the Honorable Minister of Health from um, Zanzibar, um, part of the United Republic of Tanzania. Really want to thank you because your presence here has really made a difference and will make a difference to um, Tanzania in terms of making people both um, the community as well as uh, um, the leadership recognize the value of human genetics, recognize the value of health research, and recognize the, the, the importance of the work that is being done in Tanzania and in Africa. So thank you very, very much for your presence and for your support. Um, before I hand over the chairmanship um, of, of the, or the chair of, of, of this session to Chris Happy, I, I really want to emphasize the, the, the pan-African nature of, 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 of H3 Africa. You've, met, you've heard um, Ambrose and, and um, Chris talk about how they are originally from Cameroon, but Ambrose is working in South Africa um, and, and Chris is working in Nigeria. I also would like to um, recognize the, the, the presence of Dr. Furaini Tuluai, who was very, very instrumental in setting up Sickle in Africa, the Sickle Pan-African Research Consortium in Tanzania. She is now based in South Africa, working with uh, Professor Michelle Ramsey at University of Witz in Johannesburg. And this really are examples of how, as H3 Africa, we are really encouraging and we're really supporting the circulation of, of, of um, excellence and experience and expertise within Africa. And this is just very, very much um, commendable for H3 Africa. Um, with regards to the Wellcome Trust as one of the funders, you've heard um, with the funding from the NIH with Jen Troyer, um, the Wellcome Trust is another funder of, of, of H3 Africa. And um, I don't know if Audrey is on, 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 on the line, but I really want to recognize the, the contribution of the Wellcome Trust for H3 Africa and also for the work that we have done in, in Tanzania, setting up um, the sickle cell program in Tanzania has really been um, made possible by the funding that we received from the Wellcome Trust for, for over 10 years. So thank you very much, Wellcome Trust. 
Um, for now, um, I will ask um, Ambrose, Chris, and um, to say a few words, and then I will ask Chris uh, to take over the chair of this um, session to introduce um, Dr. Yaiza Del Pozo Martin, who is the editor of Lancet Hematology, so that um, we can start um, the next session, which is the launch of the hematology series on hematology in Africa. Welcome, Chris, to take over the chair um, and then to hand over to Yaiza. Thank you. Unless um, Dr. Siana, Ambrose, um, is there anything else that you'd like to say? Uh, not really, Julie, from my end. I think we can proceed as you said before. Okay. Chris, I'm happy to hand over to you. Thank you. Chris? Oh, sorry. Siana, did you want to say something? Dr. Siana Karibu. Siana, did you want to say something? Everything from, from us as well. Thank you so Siana, much. Did you want to say something? From, Thank, you. From, from, Thank you so Siana, much. You want... Back to you, Chris. Thank you, Julie. Uh, again, it's a unique pleasure to be here and then to chair. And I want to believe that we are co-chairing this, um, this, this session together. And I think, you know, after the, the, the speech we heard from um, the, the officials of the uh, Federal Republic of uh, United Republic of Tanzania, uh, we, we, we could see exactly that, you know, H, uh, the, the Tanzania Society of uh, Human Genetics is highly supported by by the government, and that's what we want to see all over Africa. Again, uh, I want to uh, thank Julie for leading this, and also thank uh, Ambrose for his presence here, and Sienna for, I mean, being in the background. So I think we can go on with the launching of the Lancet Dermatology series, you know, and uh, priorities in the methodological care, you know, in Sub-Saharan Africa. I think we will um, uh, uh, give, I mean, start up with um, an overview you know, uh, from the series lead. And then this should be uh, by Professor Julie McCanny. I think Julie needs no introduction uh, here in this space. And, 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 and I don't think that, you know, I mean, uh, in the interest of time, I think, uh, Julie, uh, I think you got 10 minutes to provide this overview of the, uh, of the series. And I, I guess after you, then we can, we can continue. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, that should be the order. Over um, to you, Julie. Thank you very much, Chris. So um, sorry about the, the this. You're absolutely right. Um, the the co-chair um, for this session is 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 um, will be Yaiza, who is the editor of the Lancet Hematology, and yourself, Chris. And Yaiza, please um, take it from here. Thank you. And some of the speakers have not joined yet, so we were considering whether we could do a small break. Uh, if if that would be okay, and then try to make uh, this because um, we could start with your presentation, Julie, but that would uh, mean that some other speakers are not joined yet. So if that I would think be okay, you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right, Dr. Yaiza. I think um, just because uh, we we do have some people who are uh, are, are going to join at two o'clock, um, which is ten minutes from now. So um, what we can do? There are a couple of options that we can um, take. But I'm very keen that we wait and start at two o'clock just to allow other people to join. So um, Vicky um, or Ambrose or Chris, I know that there are quite a lot of resources that we have um, in H3 Africa um, with regards to um, videos or, 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 or links. Is that something that we can put up? Alternatively, the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics, this is an opportunity if you want to say anything or if you want to comment, um, um, please, um please do so so i i do agree with you guys that we should um take a break and then come um back um at at, at the hour and another option julie if you may is to give more time for presentations um mm -hmm. uh, within the the lancet methodology series uh, my my worry is that we give now 40 minutes i lose some of the activities um and yeah, that's, that, that sounds, sounds good to me. I, I, I mean, if the, some of you can, can you know, um, prolong the presentation a bit longer, that that would work. 
Um, and then we could shuffle around the orders so that we make sure uh, some of the presenters um, are there towards the end. Um, so as you prefer, should we should we come should we um, hold the session then for a small break for say um, ten minutes and then reconvene? Yeah, that will work then. So we can say we start at half past half past what the hour time. Okay, that sounds good. So we we'll start at uh, half past the hour. Um, wherever you are. I would suggest, Julie, I know that you got a few things, you know, in your presentation, if you could tweak a little bit in the next few minutes, you know, to add a few things that could, I mean, inspire, I keep saying you the role model, you know, just <laughs> a lot of this young looking up to you. If you could just tweak it and then a little bit the way you know good, <laughs> that would be great. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try and do that. Thank you very much, Chris. Very kind of you. Thank you. So we'll be back in, 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 in 10 minutes or at um, 30 minutes past the hour. Thank you. Hi, yeah, Isaac, um, or oh, Chris, is, is there a difference? Can you hear me well now, or is this better? Um, no, we can hear you very well. I yeah, can hear okay, you. Great, great, you thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so, um, we are happy to start, so if we can now um, remove the slide. I think we are still waiting for um, Professor Oren to join. Now we will stop around the, the presentations today. OK, shall we start then? Um, hello, everyone. Um, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be joining this free session from. Um, ahead of time, but we will be making the recording of the session available afterwards. And some of you are also joining us uh, via YouTube um, to make this session uh, free to access for you. So thank you for joining us today for the launch of the Lassen Hematology series uh, on priorities in hematological care in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm Dr. Jaisa del Pozo Martin, Acting Editor-in-Chief of The Lancet Hematology, and I'm joined today by five wall experts who contributed to this series. This project was initiated by the journal with me as lead editor, and we were really lucky to come with the expert guidance of Professor Julie Makani from Muhimbili University of Health and Allied Sciences uh, from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, who advise us on the topics and the experts that finally made this series. Professor Makani also contributed with a comment providing an, providing an overview of this series that you can now access online at thelancet.com. And she will be giving the first talk today. To Julie, please note that we will uh, have time for questions at the end. So please do submit your questions on the uh, little uh, Q&A live um, chatbot that we have um, here on the screen. Um, also, I would like to remind um, speakers of time that since we are ahead of the schedule, uh, please do prolong your talk a little bit while we wait for the other speakers. And with this, and without further delay, I would like to hand over to Julie for her presentation. Thank you, Professor McCanny. Thank you very much, Dr. Aiza. Sorry, just um, if you give me time. Yes, yeah, may I ask um, if you could just um, introduce the other speakers? I don't know if you have the bio biographies of um, the other speakers while, whilst I sort out my um, presentation. Thank you. The lead for this series um, and, and to um, help us to envision and to help us to recruit also all the experts that have uh, participated in the series. So um, with us today, we have um, Dr. Martin Wangi from the School of Public Health and Family Medicine from the University of Malawi in Blantia, Malawi. 
is an expert in iron deficiency anemia, and that's the topic that he will be covering today in, in his talk with a call to action for change in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, then we also have with us Professor Ambrash Burnkamp, who has been already with us in the session earlier today. Um, Professor Burnkamp is from the Department of Medicine, University of Cape Town, uh, South Africa, and he will be telling us about transferable strategies for the prevention and care of sickle cell disease. We are also having a talk today by Professor Jackson Oren from the Uganda Cancer Institute in Kampala, Uganda, and he will be covering endemic hematologic malignancies in Sub-Saharan Africa and telling us about the East African cooperative model who could be um, taken as an exemplar to improve care in the region. And finally, we will have with us uh, Dr. Yvonne De Adomako from the Department of Hematology, University of Ghana Medical School, Accra, Ghana. Uh, Dr. De Adomako will about the challenges and opportunities for safer blood supply in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is uh, the list of uh, great speakers we have today. Um, and uh, just to let everyone know that also all the papers will be available at thelancet.com um, from 2 p.m. today, Central African time. So um, you can access the, all the uh, extent, extended work of the authors there. Uh, so looking forward to the presentations. Uh, Julie, are you ready now? Oh, I think you're muted. Oh, there you go. Great. Thank you very much, um, um, Dr. Yaiza. So um, I had the um, real honor of working with um, Yaiza on, on the series on hematology in Africa. So we had a lot of discussion as to how we should structure it um, and how we can try and identify the priorities of um, hematology, particularly hematology care in um, Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, I am obviously very, very biased because I work in hematology and I've been working in hematology for the past um, 16, 18 years. And um, when I was um, thinking about um, writing the commentary, which I had the um, honor of working with um, Dr. Grace Moshi, Professor Grace Moshi, who is a, a um, proper hematologist, Tanzanian born, and has had a lot of work and experience working in um, Tanzania, South Africa, Australia, and is currently working in Singapore. She is um, also the, the, the um, adjunct faculty at Mubili University and helping us set up um, the laboratory and the clinical infrastructure for gene therapy. So when we were thinking about the commentary that we wrote for this series, um, I thought about um, what is hematology? And um, I have these three quotes that I, I, I got. If you, any of you are fans of, of um, the book or the film, Bram Stoker's um, Dracula, um, he, Dracula said, blood is life. And that is something that we working in the field of hematology very much believe that. Um, for, um, from the Bible, um, that for the life of the flesh is in the blood, really emphasizing that blood is um, the basis of that. And then William Harvey, who is probably known um, or considered to be the, 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 the one of the main fathers of modern hematology or hematology and blood transfusion, said this. And so I conclude that blood lives and is nourished of itself and in no way depends on any other part of the body as being prior to it or more excellent. So that from this, we may perceive the causes not only of life in general, but also of longer or shorter life, of sleeping and waking, of skill, of strength, and so forth. This, I think, is really, when you, when you start really t um, looking at each of these statements or each of these words, I think it really says a lot about hematology and blood in terms of this 
when you look at hematopoietic stem cells, when you look at how and why blood is such an important aspect of, of life and health. So in thinking about hematology and prioritizing, what should we talk about in the series of hematology in Africa? Hematology is one of those conditions that is everywhere. It can be treated at any level and it should be treated at any level. And this is where when you listen to um, the talk and when you read the series by um, the, the review by um, Dr. Mwangi, uh, Martin Mwangi, who, who is talking about iron deficiency. Iron deficiency is the most common form of anemia globally. It's very, very common. And the tragedy about iron deficiency is that most of the time, and we'll hear more about this from Dr. Mwangi, it is treatable, whether it's due to um, infect infestations from hookworms, which is still um, occurring in some places in Africa, but co more commonly, whether it's due to uh, nutritional anemia, which is identifiable and is treatable, or it's due to other causes that may be more, um, more uh, subtle. So when we were thinking about it, when we were thinking about hematology, we were thinking, okay, should we talk about iron deficiency? Should we talk about sickle cell disease? And this um, figure on the left really outlines the different aspects of hematology. And this is really just selected um, aspects of hematology, whether you're talking about bone marrow failure syndrome, such as pancytopenia and um, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, which is an area of expertise of Professor Lucio Luzato and Dr. Moshungi Ali, whether you're talking about red blood cell disorders and you'll hear from um, Professor Ambrose Walcom about um, sickle cell disease, whether we're talking about white blood cell disorders, and here we're talking about um, hematological disorders or hematological cancers, and um, Professor Jackson Oram, who runs the university, um, the Uganda Cancer Institute, will talk about um, the hematological cancers that they manage in, in Uganda. And then the most important thing is really blood transfusion. And Dr. Yvonne from Uganda is really um, one of the um, first investigators um, leading the blood safe um, initiative from the NIH, NHLBI, where they are looking to conduct health research in blood transfusion in Africa. Dr. Yvonne from um, Ghana has led and is leading a group of investigators that are looking at the implementation research questions around blood transfusion. And so we'll hear about this um, um, from her, her presentation and you'll be able to read about this in, in her review. So when we think about hematology, whether it's hematology as a discipline in itself, whether it is part of internal medicine in adults or part of pediatrics in children, whether it's a key component of surgery, and we know that it has a major, major aspect when you look at the um, top causes of, um, of maternal mor uh, morbidity and mortality, it is maternal anemia and it is um, post or peripartum hemorrhage. So blood, I know I'm biased, but blood really is life. So what we, what we also wanted to do as part of this series was to make sure that not only did we not um, focus just on tertiary healthcare facilities, but we also wanted to make sure that there is, to a certain extent, a continuum of care. And so um, when you look at, when you read the series of, or, the, or the four articles, you will see how the work that is being done at Uganda Cancer Institute, the work that is, that is being done in um, centers of excellence um, in, in, in sickle cell disease, the work that is being done in, in um, iron deficiency anemia really touches on all the um, three levels of healthcare in terms of healthcare facilities as well as home-based care. So this is what we ended up um, identifying. And as I said, this is really just the beginning of trying to disentangle all the achievements or highlight all the achievements that have been made in hematology in Africa and identifying the gaps and the opportunities that we can um, um, take advantage of. So um, um, Grace Moshi and myself um, 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 wrote the commentary and then you will hear from um, Dr. Martin Wangi, who will talk about um, iron deficiency anemia. Again, um, referring to what we're talking about, the pan-African nature of, of um, this series, as well as, um, as, as well as H3 Africa and African Society of Human Genetics. Dr. Ma Martin Wangi is 
originally or genetically from um, Kenya, but he's working in Malawi. And as um, as we speak now, he's actually in in transit in Netherlands, um, going to um, a meeting. Then um, blood cancers and um, Professor Jackson Oram is um, the director of the Uganda Cancer Institute, which is really a flagship um, um, organization in East Africa, in, um, in um, Africa, that is really identifying um, and, and treating um, cancers. And these are all cancers. And he will talk about um, their experience in, in, uh, in treating hematological cancers in Uganda. Um, you all know um, Professor Ambrose Wonkam. He is um, a medical geneticist in, um, in South Africa. And he and his colleagues have talked about sickle cell disease from the research perspective, the hematological perspective. And it really is a fantastic um, review that, I have, that they have done identifying what are the key areas that we have made progress and what are the key areas that we need to strengthen. Finally, and, and um, Professor Wonkam is um, in the top right hand corner, um, Dr. Mwangi um, is on the top left corner. And then this is an image from the Uganda Cancer Institute. Um, on the right, um, um, bottom left corner, right corner, is um, Dr. Yvonne, um, who runs the blood transfusion um, program in Uganda and really is, um, as I said, the a lead um, and one of the principal investigators of um, one of the blood safe um, consortia, really making fantastic um, strides in implementation research around blood transfusion bearing in mind that there has been extensive strengthening of blood transfusion services across countries in Africa because of um, ensuring safe blood as part of the um, um, prevention of, of tra horizontal transmission of, of, of um, um, HIV. So when we were um, talking about the series and when we were discussing this with with um, lancet hematology and then with the investigate and then with the um, authors we wanted and we wanted them to emphasize the fact that um, we in africa have taken either directly indirectly an integrated approach to um, hematology in africa priority is really providing and improving the um, standard of care. So under healthcare, um, here's an image of um, exchange blood transfusion for sickle cell disease. This was done manually in, um, in Aga Khan Hospital in, in Tanzania in August with, with um, um, investigators, doctor, um, I mean doctors, um, Dr. Freddy Luoga and Dr. Mashungi Ali, as well as um, the, the patient who, who, who um, um, received the manual exchange transfusion with the mentorship and, and supervision online by um, Doc, uh, Professor Lucio Luzato. So um, training, and um, here I'll refer to what um, Chris has mentioned about really at the center of, of everything that we do is training, education, and improving capacity of the many, many people who have and have been working and are working in hematology and blood transfusion. And the picture here is an image from a fantastic conference that we had in Tanzania in 2018 called the Advances. It wasn't a conference, it was a course, Advances in Hematology in Africa. And this is a course that um, Advances in Hematology is a course that has been running for more than uh, uh, 50 years in, in London at the Hammersmith Hospital, where both myself, Lucho and Grace um, worked there. Obviously, Lucho was the head of the department, and this was at different times. And so when we um, decided that we would have um, the course, Advances in Hematology in Africa, it was very daunting, but we were very, very pleased because we were able to have the course in, in 2018, and we were able to run this course and have really top, top class um, speakers attend the course, Fumio Lopade, who is in the middle, and who you will hear speaking as part of um, this conference, um, Dr. Magdalena Limo, who is now head of the blood transfusion service in Tanzania, Dr. Stella Rezaula, who is the first female hematologist in Tanzania, and Dr. Hadidia Mwinula, who is a um, pediatrician with an expertise in um, pediatric hematology. Dr. Grace Boshi is on the right-hand side. 
And so really looking at short-term training, long-term training, and trying to highlight that there has been training that has been ongoing in hematology in Africa. In terms of research, again, throughout the four speakers, you will hear how research has really been at the core of the work that they have been doing in the various disciplines. This is an, a, a map that shows um, the work that Ambrose and I have been doing really with colleagues, amazing, amazing colleagues in South Africa, Tanzania, Ghana, Nigeria. With support from the NHLBI in the NIH, we've been able to set up a Pan-African um, consortium and we have been able to enroll more than 13,000 individuals with sickle cell disease across different ages, across three countries. And this is really the largest um, um, cross-sectional um, enrollment or registry of sickle cell patients in the world. And it's really a pleasure that we do. One of the things that is, is, is important for me to mention here is the role that Solomon Ofori Aqua, who you will hear about, uh, who will be speaking later um, during the conference um, in the next couple of days. But when we were writing the grant um, for, for, um, for Sparkle and Sadak, the resources and the experience and expertise from Solomon was absolutely critical in the success that we had in getting the grants. So um, thank you to Solomon of Oriakwa for, for his um, input and his support in making Sickle in Africa possible. Um, advocacy is something that, again, you will hear about. Very important, and advocacy is at three levels. Um, here's a photograph of um, um, Professor Jackson Oram from the Uganda Cancer Institute um, from a paper educating the public about the work and the services available at Uganda Cancer Institute. Um, with healthcare providers that, and, 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 and um, investigators who um, work at UCI. Um, working with the community, and here we're talking about really the community of um, individuals who are affected by disorders, whether it's a chronic disorder such as sickle cell disease, or it's um, a, 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 a chronic disorder like, like a, a cancer, whether it's a chronic um, lymphocytic leukemia, or whether it's um, a community of, of acute illnesses such as iron deficiency anemia. And here um, we have also communities of blood donors where we want to make sure that we have long-term blood donors. We have set up a registry of, of blood donors so that we can strengthen the, 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 the um, um, bone marrow donor registry. And this picture shows Dr. Emmanuel Balandia, who is the principal investigator in Tanzania, um, with the workshop that he um, was involved with, with Arafa Salim and Daima in training and um, providing education to patients with sickle cell disease in Tanzania. And again, this is work that is echoed across um, countries in Africa. Finally, in terms of um, advocacy, high level engagement, um, we heard today from the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics, from the Minister of Health, um, of, of Zanzibar, as well as from um, the um, president of, of um, Tanzania, the former president of Tanzania, um, President Kikwete, his representative, um, Ambassador Togolani. And here, um, again, this was a, a, a visit to the NIH that was made possible by Ambassador Togolani, where the president um, Kikwete, as well as other heads of state, as part of the um, Africa Summit that was organized by President Barack Obama at that time, visited the NIH um, and heard um, about the work that the NIH is doing in Africa and the potential opportunities for partnership. And so this is a picture with the NIH director, Dr. Francis Collins, and the director of NHLBI, Dr. Gary Gibbons, and the director of Fogarty, Dr. Roger Glass. So uh, in terms of education and training, um, this is something that is 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 um, important, and here we've just given an example of formal um, training. Um, this is like a training at academic um, 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 institutions, so training of doctors, training of laboratory scientists, and training of nurses. And what we wanted to emphasize here is that there is an importance of training for hematology and blood transfusion at all levels, undergraduate, postgraduate, and postdoctoral. 
But then we recognize also that we also have to strengthen education and training at all levels, primary health care and in the different specialities. And again, we have looked at and we have learned from H3 Africa, we've learned from existing models um, on how we can train hematologists in blood transfusion in all these areas. Um, this is a fantastic slide that, that you will see in, in, in the commentary that um, from Dr. Grace Moshi, really looking at the importance of par partnerships. We are lucky that many countries in Africa have very strong public health um, systems. The advantage of public health systems is that they exist. The disadvantage is that they need to be strengthened. And so almost all the investigators or all the reviewers um, um, that, that, that will speak work either with public health institutions or work very, very closely with public health institutions. And, um, and so really looking at vaccination programs with hematology care, establishment of disease registries, and how we can integrate government laboratory in managing and prioritizing hematological care. In terms of capacity building, and here we're really talking not just human capacity, but capacity in terms of looking at manufacturing medicines and vaccines. And here we have examples in Nigeria, examples in Tanzania, and really the fantastic examples with the COVID-19 vaccine in um, South Africa with regards to manufacturing medicines on the continent for the continent. And then in terms of research, we really emphasized that the focus of the series is hematological care, but it has to be integrated with research in the sense that you can't say, let me just improve healthcare and then I will start doing the research or the other way around, let me do research and then I will translate my knowledge into improving healthcare. No, we said, and this is um, approach that we used in sickle cell disease with a paper that's written by um, Dr. Foreni Tuluai, where she looks at how an integrated um, approach in sickle cell disease has helped in terms of strengthening research as well as health healthcare and um, training. And then finally, the partnerships that we mentioned before, partnerships at different levels in different ways, and the importance of this in order to ensure sustainability. So finally, really just want to say a bit about science. And I am absolutely fascinated. And if you have time, please look at this short video that um, um, is available on, on, on the, um, the link there. And this was a, a video where um, Francois was asked, um, why is she obsessed or why is she looking to find a cure for HIV? And this is, um, I quote, where she said, we are not making science for science, we're making science for the benefit of humanity. If you are working on human disease, you must have a relationship with people living with the disease. And this is because the patients with HIV went to her and said, you identified the virus. And because of that discovery, she um, received the Nobel Prize in, in 2008. They said, you identify the virus, what are you going to do about it? You have to find a cure for, for this. And I think this is where a lot of the, and this is where, um, as an example, and you'll hear a lot about this um, from um, the talk by um, Ambrose is, in hematology in Africa, when we're searching for a cure, whether this is for iron deficiency, anemia, whether this is for sickle cell disease, whether this is for hematological um, cancers, um, how are we going to find a cure for some of the hematological disorders? Who's going to do it? Where are we going to do it? When are we going to do it? Is this in the next three years or is it in the next 10 years? What are we going to do? What are we going to prioritize? Are we going to prioritize hemophilia and gene therapy and the fantastic work that is already being done in in um, in in Cape Town in in Johannesburg by Johnny Machlangu, or is it going to be um, leukemia with work that is being done by um, Anna Shu and colleagues? How are we going to do this? And as an example, this is a figure that focuses and um, biased obviously on sickle cell disease and in Tanzania, where we started answering those questions around 
gene therapy for sickle cell disease. We had the advances in hematology course in 2018. We had the gene editing workshop in 2020. And we identified two hospitals where we can do gene therapy and participate in gene therapy trials. And then in terms of who and how, we have been very, very fortunate with Professor Lucho Luzato being in Tanzania, uh, Marina Cabazzana, who, 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 who did the first successful transplant in France, um, visited us and um, attended the, the advances in hematology course in, um, in 2018 with Elian Gluckman, who's um, renowned for um, transplants, and um, Grace Moshi, who um, is my co-author for the commentary, and Dr. Siana, who is um, a really fantastic and the president of the Tanzania Society of Human Genetics, as well as being an excellent, excellent scientist. So really trying to look at how we do this, where we do this, when, how we're going to fund this, and working with entities such as H3Africa, um, the Global Gene Therapy Initiative, to making this a reality in Africa. So thank you very much for listening. I think I've taken a long time, but we're very fortunate, touch wood, that we're, um, we've got enough time. This is Grace and myself um, at a meeting in 2019 in, in Rome. This was a meeting that was organized by, by um, Elian um, Gluckman, really looking at how we can make transplant and gene therapy accessible um, globally. And um, want to thank individuals, community healthcare providers, researchers, government industry, NGOs, funders, who have really supported us. Sickle in Africa, H3 Africa, H3 Bowen, and Sickle Gen Africa are all supported by the U.S. National Institutes of Health, and the Sickle Cell Program in Tanzania receives support in the setup um, by the Wellcome Trust. So thank you very much, everyone, for listening to me. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Julie, for this terrific presentation. Um, and giving a fantastic overview of the series and of the different authors that have contributed to this project. Um, so I'm really excited now to start also with the uh, rest of the speakers. So first up, uh, we are going to have Dr. Martin Mawangi, uh, Mawangi sorry, uh, from the School of Public Health and Family Medicine, University of Malawi, um, who will tell us about iron deficiency anemia, as Julie um, previously introduced. So. Please, Martin. Hi, can you hear me? Is it, uh, yes, we can hear you. And can you see my screen? Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Julie. Thank you, Yaiza. Um, I'm really delighted to be to join you this afternoon uh, in this uh, meeting to present to you about uh, iron deficiency anemia in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is really a call to action because, um, as Professor Julie already explained, uh, most of the uh, evidence really on the table. It's now how we translate it to practice. Now, this our paper is part of the Lancet Hematology series, uh, Priorities in Hematological Care in Sub Saharan Africa, which is being launched today. So, this is also another um, exciting moment for us. My name is uh, Martin Mwangi, and I'm a nutritional epidemiologist, um, senior research fellow based at the Training and Research Unit of Excellence at the College of Medicine in University of Malawi. We wrote this paper with my uh, fellow co-authors as listed, and I'm really presenting on their behalf, and I also want to thank them for working with us on this. Um, we sought to review the causes, uh, burden, and consequences of iron deficiency anemia in the general population of sub-Saharan Africa. And we also sought to review the current policies and interventions for the control of iron deficiency anemia in the general population of sub-Saharan Africa, and then present the evidence and uh, also see where the continent or the region could do better. And so I start by presenting to you the epidemiology of iron deficiency anemia in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is based on the most recent data that have been published by the World Health Organization about the region. And to say the least, the anemia prevalence in various population groups, preschool age children, pregnant women, non-pregnant women, it's saddening um, compared to the rest other regions in the world. So among preschool age children, um, reading from the table at the top, 
67.6% uh, of uh, preschool uh, children have anemia. And this translates to around uh, 83.5 million infected children. And when you look at pregnant women, 57% of pregnant women um, have anemia. And this translates roughly to 72.2 million pregnant women. And in the soon to be or the future mothers, that's a non-pregnant women, 47.5% of this uh, population is uh, anemic. And this translates roughly to 70 million um, individuals or non-pregnant women um, living with anemia. And if you look at the map on my lower left of the screen, you can see that Sub-Saharan Africa really has the bulk of the burden of anemia globally. And the reasons are multiple, as we all know, the causes of anemia are multiple, but really in the region, the determinants of anemia are mainly um, as a result of diet. Uh, we know that most diets are monotonous and plant-based um, with a lot of anti-nutrient factors such as phytates. And since uh, most bioavailable iron is actually from animal source foods, this predisposes the populations to anemia. We also have a number of uh, infectious diseases and uh, also, uh, you know, for example, worms like hookworms that are still prevalent in some certain regions in the, uh, of Sub-Saharan Africa. Malaria endemicity is also a challenge. Uh, this is also a, a, a subtropical zone that is um, still struggling with a lot of malaria. And then, as has already been uh, highlighted by previous speakers, uh, the genetic background of populations in Sub-Saharan Africa sometimes predisposes us to um, higher prevalences of anemia. Our health systems, luckily, as Professor Julie has already said, are there, but they need serious strengthening to be able to cope with the prevalences of anemia as, uh, as highlighted above. Um, in addition to that, we have barriers to scaling up iron interventions. And notably, uh, when you uh, uh, scale up, uh, for example, iron supplementation in children, you are worried that you might cause more malaria based on evidence. And therefore, uh, we noted uh, during our search, our literature search, that various uh, um, uh, countries or various population groups um, are not being covered because of uh, certain conflicting policies. In addition to that, we have uh, this region experiencing a rapid population growth. And soon we are going to, the next uh, couple of uh, years, uh, we're going to surpass a number of regions when it comes to the population of the, of, of, uh, as highlighted above. Um, so we're going to be a region of about 3.1 billion people. And that means the problem of dealing with anemia is it's just going to be worse if we don't do anything now. So in our uh, literature, literature search, in our writing, in our analysis, we came up with um, seven core key messages that need to go out urgently uh, to call to action various uh, stakeholders to intervene so that we can bring, uh, well, control the, the challenge of iron deficiency anemia in the region of Sub-Saharan Africa. The first message directed at pregnant women is really about adherence. And this is adherence to iron supplementation during pregnancy, which now we know, we have evidence that the, if, if there is proper adherence, this is likely to lead to substantial reduction in postpartum hemorrhage induced maternal mortality and to increased birth weight of the newborns. Um, we know that the mother-to-be generation in, uh, in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and especially pregnant women, currently uh, go into pregnancy with inadequate stores, um, yet this is compounded by the fact that they have low iron intake, as, as I already explained, and yet this is a period of pregnancy, is a period why, where the, there is high iron requirements. What we end up seeing is increased maternal mortality, postpartum hemorrhage, uh, prematurity of the newborns, and a low birth weight of the newborns, thereby leading to them being unable to survive the first thousand days. And there is now uh, mounting evidence that this also um, has an effect on the future brain development of the newborns. In later life, when the children are growing, um, there is now evidence that um, the diets are of the, in terms of com complementary foods are iron poor. And these children are also growing 
um, in environments uh, with a lot of inflammation. And we now know that inflammation also causes uh, um, iron absorption to be affected. This impacts on the growth of these children. And this seems to be a vicious cycle because uh, over time, these become adolescents and they are, the females go to become pregnant and the cycle is uh, repeated and it has to be arrested at some, po at some point. The second key message is also directed to pregnant women, but this time around, it's about the national programs in various countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. These national programs for antenatal iron supplementation urgently need strengthening and some of them actually need overhauling and almost all of them require international financial and technical support if they are going to be able to improve delivery and create demand for their services. And this is the backdrop to this is that we now have seen that iron supplementation works, but how do you deliver um, iron supplements to pregnant women at the right time at the, to all populations in such a vast region? Africa is huge and governments are struggling to cope uh, in terms of national programs. The other message, key message is directed to children. And these are two messages, message three and four. The first one is actually in line with the World Health Organization recommendations that iron intervention should not be given to children in malaria endemic areas unless we give them in conjunction with measures to prevent malaria. And this is really to prevent, uh, to protect the children from, you know, getting more sick from malaria and possibly even dying. Now, the new thing that we are calling for here is that uh, when you give iron interventions to these children, you should, this should be administered to individual recipients of iron interventions, rather than giving them in mass to the general public. And um, usually when governments uh, or when national programs do, do these kind of interventions, it's very difficult to do, um, you know, uh, assess of whether you have, um, you know, malaria and also then uh, treat. It's very difficult because of lack of resources, because of inadequate programs, challenges of reach. Um, and therefore, um, we, we tend to see that populations uh, or other national programs tend to prioritize mass uh, interventions. The other key message is on delayed cord clamping. There is now good evidence that the cord clamping um, actually can prevent or delay the onset of iron deficiency anemia in late infancy when children are most susceptible. And therefore we call for this to be um, you know, scaled up, if not being scaled up and standardized in most countries so that we have um, newborns benefiting from this. The other key message five is directed at adolescent girls and non-pregnant women. Sufficient iron stores should be attained before pregnancy or between pregnancies to prevent iron deficiency and anemia during pregnancy. But we noted that insufficient attention is given in research and policies to adolescent girls, perhaps on the grounds that iron deficiency anemia is relatively uncommon in this group. Now, if you look at the graph that I've put there uh, in terms of growth in vis-a-vis -vis the human life cycle, uh, iron is required in all stages of growth from infancy, child, adolescent, all the way to old age. But what you want is a prime adult who has uh, the sufficient iron stores to go on, to couple up and probably go on to have a child who is also going to grow into a young person adolescent who is capable of becoming another prime adult. We have to aim to be getting at and stays in our prime as far as iron supplementation is concerned. For adolescent girls, policies should be reviewed to give women of reproductive age, including adolescent girls, access to contraceptives with a specific aim of controlling menstrual bleeding and its associated anemia and to build iron stores. We noted that uh, adolescent girls and access to contraceptives is a bit of an unrecognized intervention point. There are very few policies directed at this population and the, the, hence the reason why we call for this um, um, uh, um, focus to be redirected to adolescent girls and non-pregnant women. Finally, a, a general key message is that uh, effective control of in infections, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, is required to improve iron absorption and utilization and to make iron intervention safe and more efficacious. This is the backdrop of the uh, hepcidine uh, evidence that has come in, uh, in the recent uh, uh, years. 
but also with the mounting evidence that if you control hookworm infestations and other infections, then uh, iron absorption is improved. And therefore, again, uh, programs to, um, for effective control of infections should be scaled up. In summary, the first one is that adherence to iron supplementation in pregnancy leads to reductions in postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, hemorrhage induced maternal mortality and increased birth weight. Cold clamping, if we adhere to cold clamping, um, we'll, this will prevent or delay the onset of iron deficiency anemia in late infancy. Uh, helmet control is a safe way to prevent iron loss in school aged children aged 5 to 18 years old and adults also. Effective control of infections is required to improve iron absorption and utilization and to make iron interventions safe and more efficacious. Now, the low coverage, lack of coordinated action, and the low priority currently given to antenatal iron supplementation in sub-Saharan Africa is simply unacceptable. And needs, we need to have a mind shift. A national program needs to be reorganized in how to tackle this problem of uh, antenatal iron supplementation. Probably new intervention, novel, novel methods like IVR, for example, need to be tested. Administering malaria preventive measures to individual recipients of iron interventions is ethically required in place of public malaria control measures that might not reach these individuals. Finally, policies should be reviewed with the aim of giving women of reproductive age, including adolescent girls, access to contraceptives with the specific purpose of controlling menstrual bleeding and its associated anemia. With that, I would like to thank everybody, especially the Lancet Hematology for uh, providing this platform and also for launching. And also I invite you to read uh, a lot more information in the paper as uh, is shown in that picture, um, where you will be able to understand or rather to, to process more the points I have just highlighted. Thank you very much. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mawangi. Uh, so our next speaker today is Professor Ambras Wonkan uh, from the Department of Medicine, University of Cape Town um, from South Africa. And he's gonna tell us about transferable strategies for prevention and care of sickle cell disease. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh... Yes, yeah, I'm gonna try to share my screen. I think my screen should be shared now. Uh, can someone confirm? Okay, thank, yeah, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure and a privilege to share some of uh, the, the work that we have done by doing this review. Uh, my gratitude to Julie to have uh, lead it and uh, to AIs that have given the opportunity to us to do this. Sickle cell disease uh, originated in Africa about 7,000 years ago, at least, and it's a condition associated with resistance uh, to malaria. Uh, did, but it get recognized to modern medicine about only 111 years ago in uh, American a student and uh, since the discovery of sickle cell disease many uh, lands important landmark of research uh, started with Louis Paulin that uh, described the mutation to the description of haplotype by Kehek Kazesian uh, to the uh, repartition global of haplotype suggesting multiple origin by my personal mentor Estilianos Antonorakis and I hope that we will contribute to this work in the many years to come uh, of our career. This condition become extremely uh, prevalent on the continent because of resistance to malaria and of the nearly 300,000 new baby of sickle cell disease that are born in the world, about 80% are born on the African continent. And it's a condition associated to the mutation that distorts the red blood cell, giving them a shape of a banana. And these red blood cells become uh, rigid under the oxygenation and become crystallized. Uh, the reason why uh, they will tend to obstruct a red blood cell. Uh, these red blood cells, these banana cells, uh, are also uh, prone to destruction. They live very uh, less than the normal red blood cell, and that will lead to anemia. So anemia 
uh, organ failure, susceptibility to infection are the main uh, complication uh, of, of sickle cell disease. And this can be summarized like this. So this patient will be subjected to major cardiovascular complication like stroke, much more than in the general population. This is an example of the image of stroke in a real patient with sickle cell disease. And in sickle cell disease, we can observe both hemorrhagic stroke on the left-hand side and also ischemic stroke and described on the right-hand side of your screen. And these uh, stroke event, unfortunately, uh, jeopardize the progress of the child and their capacity to respond uh, to executive function as measure, for example, in Cameroon, a true evaluation of cognitive deficit that clearly become to uh, be different uh, between sickle cell disease patient and control from year 10. That means that interventions for care and prevention should happen much more earlier uh, in life of these children. Uh, for all too recently, there was no definitive treatment for sickle cell disease. And most uh, treatment at the moment, and it is the case in most African countries, as we have seen in the review, are based on pain, antibiotherapy, uh, transfusion, and rehydration. But we know that evolving treatment that unfortunately are not yet available in most African countries are based on anti-adhesion, augmentation of fetal hemoglobin, for example, using hydroxyurea, on bone marrow transplantation that are available in only uh, a few African countries, actually through Nigeria and South Africa, and be developed at the moment in, uh, in Tanzania, and gene editing and gene therapy that have become increasingly, maybe, the future of uh, sickle cell disease uh, cure. So we have proposed in the review a few guidelines that are very flexible for sickle cell disease cure on the African continent. But this guideline will not be useful if we do not have enough specialized center of sickle cell disease care on the continent. And this uh, slide that you will see in that paper describe the country that have a comprehensive care centers on the left-hand side. And you can see that most of Southern African country will not have a comprehensive, specialized comprehensive care center for sickle cell disease. And only two actually have effective care center for stem cell transplantation. And Tanzania hopefully will be having their capacity of doing those transplantation recently. I must stress that the capacity of doing hematopoietic transplant will be an important capacity to implement gene editing or gene therapy for sickle cell disease. So we will need to improve this map in the years to come. So what we have left is screening strategy uh, that can be at the neonatal level and very few African countries do newborn screening. We can also extend it to genetic diagnostic before birth, but we know from our own work by implementing this technique in Cameroon about uh, 15 years ago and in Cape Town here about 10 years ago, that the uptake is conditioned by the difficulty faced by parents uh, living with children with sickle cell disease. And the uptake, for example, in Nigeria and Cameroon is very high for genetic diagnostic before birth, but nearly zero here in Cape Town where I work because of optimal care provided to patients with sickle cell disease. We also know that the action, uh, reproductive action, associated with genetic diagnosis before, but pose in important ethical challenges as based on numerous work that we have on work done in Africa. Which means that one of the things that we want to focus our attention to is a measure that can allow secondary prevention of complication of sickle cell disease in addition to newborn screening. The implementation of newborn screening, uh, penicillin prophylaxis, the use of adaxuria have dropped the newborn, the mortality in children to nearly zero uh, in America, but the mortality in adults have not changed over the past 40 years in America. So you can imagine that in Africa, we will have a worse situation because very few countries have implemented newborn screening as we have shown in the map before. And that means that in many parts of the world, both Africa and all the other nations that have more resources, we have problem of solving both children mortality and adult mortality. 
Adult mortality in America, for example, will be due to chronic cardiovascular complications as shown on this picture. And uh, my presentation will be a little bit biased toward genetics. I'm, after all, a geneticist. And uh, we convince, uh, we try to convince the community that sickle cell disease will represent a best model to investigate both uh, a monogenic disease and complex threat. Because this is a disease that is monogenic, but is also subjected to environmental factor, but also to other genetic variants that condition its severity. This may be probably the reason why the lethality of sickle cell disease is not 100% even on Africa continent. Even without treatment, we know that the lethality will be around 80%, not 100%. Kidney dysfunction, for example, is subject to genetic variation, including for the study that we perform here uh, uh, in, on the African continent. And at least three or four variants will explain most of the kidney associated, highly associated kidney dysfunction uh, in sickle cell disease. Some of the early studies performed with our student, Kutala, show that there may be some variants that are associated with pain in sickle cell disease. And some other author study in America have shown that using a Bayesian model, you may be able, a mathematical model, to predict stroke using a combination of variants in multiple genes and all, or using a peripheral transcriptomic to classify a patient as highly likely to die or not to, to die. And but the most important modifier of sickle cell disease have been fetal hemoglobin, the level of fetal hemoglobin. This is a part a hemoglobin that is produced during our fetal life that normally become uh, very low in adult life, near to zero. But patients that keep the capacity of keep producing fetal hemoglobin have a longer life expectancy. And this has been shown at least 40 years ago in the cooperative study in America. This is a, a, a fetal hemoglobin is a quantitative threat that is inheritable. That is also subjected to genetic variation. Study in Europe, in America, in Tanzania from Julie work and in our own work in Cameroon have shown that uh, these variations are very much common in all sickle cell disease patients uh, in the world. And this knowledge have allowed to cure a patient or mice with sickle cell disease by deleting, for example, an important transcriptional repressor of sickle cell disease. In other words, a gene that stopped the production uh, or that repressed the production of fetal hemoglobin. And when that discovery was done, everybody was very enthusiastic by saying that actually if we stop the expression of that gene BCL11, we're gonna cure sickle cell disease. But it was not that simple because experiment from nature illustrated in these children that naturally have a deletion of BCL11 shows that they actually have an increased level of fetal hemoglobin, but they also have some level of uh, mental disability and some brain malformation, making BCL11 a quasi undruggable drug, uh, genes. Fortunately, the team of Stuart Hawkins in the West Coast in the United States, East Coast in the United States, in Boston specifically, have shown that there are uh, some variation in the hands of BCL11, that is upstream of BCL11, that is specifically expressed and uh, with some in, in, in the red blood cell. That means that if you modify those variations, you can modify the expression of only in red blood cell. And uh, by uh, modifying, they clearly show using cell model that you increase the level of fetal hemoglobin, but only in red blood cell, which increase uh, the prospect of using that uh, variation for treatment of sickle cell disease. If I can summarize this in a layman term, BCL11 is a transcriptional repressor of fetal hemoglobin. Without BCL11 expression, you have an increased level of fetal hemoglobin. You will cure your child with sickle cell disease, but you will have some neurodevelopmental abnormality. But if you modify an enhancer that is upstream of BCL11, a controller of the controller, you will increase the level of fetal hemoglobin without other uh, problem. And this is, will be the perfect approach to cure sickle cell disease. This is the way uh, this year, a few reports on gene editing have been published for sickle cell disease, offering a lot of hope for many of the patients that we have on the African continent. 
We believe very strongly in a paper that we published a couple of days ago in Nature that the key for sickle cell disease therapy is within genomics. Either by modifying fetal hemoglobin modifying loci or by using RNA therapy for treatment of sickle cell disease. One of those options, for example, may be exploring microRNA for treatment of sickle cell disease. Our own work have shown that microRNA was very important at the mechanism of hydroxyria induced fetal hemoglobin in treatment of sickle cell disease. And many other people's work, even recent work, have shown that this uh, uh, microRNA was very important for post-transcriptional uh, modification of expression of fetal hemoglobin, which means that in the years to come, by investing sufficiently research on microRNA, we can imagine using a microfiber to package those microRNA and provide alternative treatment by injecting directly them in bone marrow. The advantage of this is that we, not, we will not be targeting only one gene, but it whole pathway of uh, fetal hemoglobin expression. The development of vaccine for uh, COVID-19... Just, just to let you know uh, that you're a bit over time already. Okay, thank you. The development of vaccine for COVID-19 have given a possibility of also using a messenger and RNA for production of fetal hemoglobin or for uh, a normal hemoglobin. But this is not the end of the story. We believe that in Africa, we will be able to find other low target for fetal hemoglobin if we use the appropriate GYs uh, array to explore it, for example, using the one developed by H3 Africa and to respond uh, to the need of the patient that are requesting. There are other questions that we have raised in that paper, for example, the evolutionary dynamic of sickle cell disease. We know that this condition has been in Africa for a very long time. Possibly Tutankhamun had sickle cell disease. That means that the pressure of the mutation on our own genome have been, have been very high. It is possible that some variant have been selected in our genome because of the condition itself. This is a proof from an analysis that was performed by uh, Professor Emil Chimusa that identified a few variants, possibly due to the pressure of selection on sickle cell disease on our genome. This is the work that we published uh, this year, and also in that paper you will see this chart. That shows that most of those, the non-variant under selection, actually are expressed with sickle cell mutation in many patients. So we still need to have a lot of work to know what is the impact of this variant to designing a genetic risk model for sickle cell disease. And lastly, it is still important we keep investigating the origin of the mutation and how the mutation spread around the world and at what time and for what reason. So hopefully we have now a good network for research on the continent, starting with Sickle Cell in, Af Sickle in Africa Consortium between SADAC and SPACO, Sickle Gen Africa under the leadership of uh, Solomon, the Sickle Cell Disease Ontology that was started by uh, Nikki Mulder, and the Sickle Pan-African Network that will be the umbrella under all these organizations. It's the time for me to thank our colleague from that for their support to thank all the people that have participated in this meeting from the attendees from many, many countries to the funders and also to uh, Lancet Hematology and other journals supporting this meeting. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Yvonne Day Adomako from the Department of Hematology, University of University of Ghana Medical School, Accra, Ghana. Uh, Dr. Dey Adomako will tell us about the challenges and opportunities for safer blood supply in Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you very much um, for the opportunity to present a very important uh, topic, safe blood in Sub-Saharan Africa, our challenges and opportunities. This is my disclosure, outline of my presentation. Um, low availability of safe blood for transfusion still remains a major challenge in Sub-Saharan Africa. 
we have challenges maintaining sufficient high quality and uh, safe supplies of blood and blood components. Um, now we know that blood supplies need to be constantly replenished. There's increased clinical demand for blood and blood products generally. Um, generally high income countries are able to meet the demand for blood and blood products. Uh, whereas in sub-Saharan Africa, we are still lagging behind. Now, transfusion of safe blood and blood products, we know saves millions of lives worldwide. Um, therefore, we do need an optimal population of adequate voluntary blood donors, uh, not just recruit them, but also be able to retain these blood donors in the blood donor pool. Blood safety remains a major, major challenge in the subregion. Uh, and there are several, several reasons why it remains a major concern for us. Uh, a few are the, um, uh, due to resource constraints, the high prevalence of transfusion transmissible um, infections, uh, persistent reliance on family replacement donors. Now, these difficulties have led to chronically insufficient safe blood supply in many countries in the sub region. Now, what are some of our challenges to save blood supply? Uh, there are several challenges. We've highlighted a few. What education are we actually giving to the public concerning blood transfusion? You know, demystifying some of the myths surrounding blood transfusion. Um, is this education sustained? What media platforms are we using to get the message out there to the public? Uh, so this is an area that is lacking in sub-Saharan Africa and should be addressed. Now, the opportunities that exist for us are numerous, but we have highlighted a few, and that is transforming the family replacement donor system to a voluntary uh, blood donor system. Uh, we need culturally appropriate interventions. Now, some have been um, implemented in some countries and have helped uh, in the blood donor pool and to retain some of their voluntary blood donors. Uh, so interventions like the planned annual calendar uh, for blood donation education and mobilization, uh, the peer recruitment programs like the Pledge 25 Club, and there are other uh, suggested interventions uh, such as uh, motivational incentives, uh, sending reminders, and mass media adverts, and so on. We need to be able to um, boost, you know, blood donation among women. How do we do that? Targeted interventions, you know, addressing their fears, having a sustained and planned educational program for them, you know, demystifying some of the myths surrounding women donating uh, blood. And these can be done uh, through a lot of, um, you know, like social media platforms as well. Uh, reducing rates of donor deferral due to anemia will certainly help a lot and we will be able to retain um, a lot of uh, blood donors. Uh, now, what kind of education are we giving them as well? Uh, nutritional education uh, will certainly help. Uh, this can be done through mass media, mobile phones, you know, uh, and so on giving iron supplementation after each blood donation. Um, these are some of the interventions that uh, uh, have been tried and tested in some uh, parts of the world. Increasing the blood donation intervals um, is also a, a suggested approach to reduce uh, uh, donor deferral due to anemia. Uh, we also need to address knowledge and communication gaps. Um, we know that a lot of communication interventions are being explored now. Um, partnerships between blood banks and radio stations, for instance, uh, has been tried and tested in Ghana and it has helped a lot uh, using mobile phone technology and a whole lot more. 
So these are all some of the opportunities that we have to improve our blood donor pool. Our key messages are that transfusion, transmissible infections, especially malaria, um, are prevalent uh, among uh, blood donors. The family replacement donor system is predominant. Uh, there's, there's a substantial proportion of uh, blood donors in sub-Saharan African countries who are still being deferred due to anemia. Women are underrepresented in the blood donor pool. Uh, poor knowledge and communication regarding blood donation. Financial constraints also hamper the supply and maintenance of our national blood services. These are a few of our recommendations to develop and adhere to national policies on blood donor selection, to include malaria screening in our national transfusion service programs, especially during the malaria seasons, and also to complement the national efforts in hepatitis B vaccination. We need to improve donor care. Uh, it's most of the time neglected through regular assessment of iron stores, follow-up telephone calls. We need to generally encourage our donors um, so that they would be, uh, they would come back and donate and remain in the donor pool. Communication approaches could help to address the scarce or inadequate knowledge about blood donation. So in conclusion, WHO through their global Blood Safety Initiative um, encourages uh, the principle of voluntary unpaid donations. Uh, the current systems uh, of blood donation with very few voluntary blood donors in Sub-Saharan Africa are unable to sustain our transfusion requirements. We now have greater health coverage, better access to healthcare, there's increase generally in demand for blood products. We need investments in screening. What screening methods are we using? Are we engaged in any quality assurance, external quality assurance programs? How well are we performing um, in these programs? We need specialist hematology services in our national blood banks and in sub-Saharan Africa. They can help uh, with our limited research capacity and also care for our donors and the general population. There's therefore the urgent need to design, implement and evaluate innovative communication approaches to help um, communication uh, and strengthen um, innovative communication approaches to help strengthen Sub-Saharan Africa blood transfusion services. And this can be done through social media. There are so many social media platforms now. Uh, the mass media, um, transfusion research is limited in the sub-region. It's time to do a lot of research um, concerning safety and availability of blood in the sub-region. Uh, misconceptions such as religious and cultural specific um, must be adequately and tactfully addressed. Um, lastly, uh, public-private um, partnerships to support our national blood services um, and to improve the quality of blood services and the blood safety value chain is needed. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to acknowledge all my co-authors uh, Dr. Lucy Asamoa Kwaku of the National Blood Service Ghana, uh, Dr. Bernard Ampia Syracuse University, Professor Alfred Yolson, and Professor Olayemi, both of the University of Ghana Medical School. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yvonne, for your presentation. So before we start the queue um, and answer session, we we're going to have now the presentation of Professor Jackson Oren, which is on hematological uh, malignancies. Unfortunately, uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, he's not with us um, today. Um, therefore, um, I thought I'll just share with you all um, the hub of the series, which is now live at 
thelancet.com, and then we can proceed to the Q&A. So let me just see if I can um, share my screen um, to show you how the series looks like on the web. There we go. Now, that's perfect. So um, yeah, just wanted to briefly take uh, viewers through the series tab. So as I said, you can go now to the lancet.com uh, slash series, Hematology Africa. You'll see there um, a small executive summary summarizing uh, the goals of the series and, and the main aims that Julie told us about earlier today. There is also um, an editorial that um, I have written on behalf of the team, or putting the series a bit more in content of uh, other initiatives uh, that the Lancet have done before in the region and the SDGs and the African Union agenda. So um, you can have a look at that editorial. Uh, and then there is Julie's fantastic comment with Grace Moshi that she told us about earlier today. Um, then there is also a little piece that I would like to highlight uh, because at the end we are doing this uh, because we care about patients. Um, and we, we got the opportunity to publish along with the series this little in focus piece um, by several patients who collaborate with the Sickle in Africa initiative. And they tell us a bit um, about their experiences, experiences of what it's like to get um, care when you have sickle cell disease in African countries they live. So we have patients from five, four or five different countries there, and but they all uh, found commonalities to tell us. So I think it's a very inspiring piece, and I will encourage you. I would encourage you all to read that. And finally, you can see the four um, papers of this series. So we just heard from Yvonne on black transfusion. We also hear about uh, Martin's paper on iron deficiency anemia. And uh, also we have the presentation from Professor um, Wonkam uh, and Bruce work on, on disease. Um, as I said, Jackson Oren and his team, Professor Jackson Oren and his team, um, unfortunately could not present today in the end, but there is his paper and I would encourage you to, to uh, read it. All this content is free to access. So please, um, I'll encourage you to, to visit the hub and engage with the content. Um, and with this, I would um, we can proceed now, I think, to the um, q and I'll stop sharing the screen now. So, um, great, thank you so much. Um, Julie, Ambras, Martin, I can see you. Yvonne, I can see you there as well. Thank you all for taking part in this session. Thank you so much for all your contributions. Um, so let's see, there are quite a few questions. Um, and let's start perhaps um, with uh, a question on something that is part of hematology, is very novel. The series um, touch on it a little bit, some of the papers, uh, and this is about uh, gene therapy. So Gaston Mathandou uh, asked for Julie, but I, I guess, Ambras, you can also uh, put your thoughts uh, about this there, since uh, your paper is about sickle cell disease. And he, he says, when I hear about gene therapy, I always think about it, it it costs involved. So considering the cost, how can gene therapy be made readily available in Africa? The burden of disease uh, in Africa can be used as an argument, perhaps, to say the cost will be shared among affected people. But still, these people are generally poor and several African governments are not involved, if not, do not care. So how to deal with the cost? Challenging question to start. It's good for Juliet. Um, absolutely. So we've been looking at that, Gaston, really. And, and, and just for people to know, Gaston is, is a fantastic um, st statistician and um, bioinformatics working in SADAC with um, Ambrose and Emil Chimusa. So it's been fantastic working with Gaston. So one of the things that we've been doing, um, and, and, and the picture that I showed um, with Grace and I at the meeting with Elian Brookman and others, is really trying to make sure that we address the issue of equity. 
Um, just as, uh, as a context, a uh, bone marrow transplant in the US or in the UK cost is around, this is bone marrow transplant, this is around $100,000 to $150,000. If you do it in in um, in India, some of the centers in India, it's around sixty thousand dollars. We have done the numbers, and we are confident. And there already is transplant that's ongoing by Nosi Bazwai in Nigeria, and um, and there's a recent editorial that um, um, Blucho has written in that we believe that we could do transplants in Africa um, at a cost of between thirty to fifty thousand dollars. So that's the first thing, and 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 as 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 mentioned by Ambrose and and, and myself is that transplant is essentially um, the platform for ex vivo gene therapy. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that governments are engaged. All the governments, if you go to Ghana, Nigeria, Tanzania, you will find extensive investment in tertiary level um, centers. You have you will see hospitals by the public sector, by the private sector that have been invested and can do transplants and are able to do transplants. One of the critical um, 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 stumbling blocks for transplantation is blood transfusion. And you've heard from Yvonne the fantastic work that they're doing. Blood transfusion has been um, one of the limiting factors in terms of being able to provide um, safe blood, um, bone marrow transplantation. So that's something that we do. The context um, of, of, of comparison with gene therapy. When you think about gene therapy, um, I mentioned transplant is $100,000 per transplant. Gene therapy is around $1, $1.2 million. Huge, huge, huge amount. So we've been working with um, an initiative called the Global Gene Therapy Initiative. This is an initiative that has that is open for anybody to be a part of, and we'd really welcome you to be a part of. Um, it was founded by Dr. Sisi Kitio from um, the, the um, Joint Clinical Research Center in Uganda and Jennifer Day from Fred Hutch in the US. And it has in, um, it's open. It's open to everyone. We meet every Thursday and we talk about issues around the whole thing about um, equity and access. So with Caring Cross, which is um, one of the NGOs that was started by Boro, um, we, we are hoping to have a manufacturing um, plant in Uganda and another one in India that will be able to manufacture the vectors, the product, um, so that when we get the stem cells from patients, rather than send the, 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 the um, stem cells, and this is work that Mohammed Zahir is doing, looking at TD34, looking at um, how we can um, collect them either from cord blood or um, from, from peripheral blood, and then process them so that we can send them um, to a, a processing center as close to the patient as possible so that they can manipulate, um, do the transaction, and then we get them the, the product back and transfuse it to the patient. So this is something that through Caring Cross GGTI, we're looking at the first center that seems to be ready um, and is working to be ready um, is, is will be in Uganda. Once the, the most expensive thing, and this is where the, there's a lot of um, discussion, the most expensive thing is, is the vector when it comes to, to, um, to gene therapy. And if we're able to get around the vector um, and the cost of the vector, then the, 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 it will be available. The final thing that I should mention, I think um, um, in, when we were in, in, in um, Ethiopia for the last H3 Africa uh, meeting, uh, the NIH and the and the World Cup, the NIH and the Gates Foundation um, um, announced an, uh, an investment of 200 million um, US dollars to gene-based therapy for sickle cell disease and HIV in Africa. So that investment, the bulk of that investment, has gone into um, um, centers outside of Africa. The interesting and the exciting thing about that investment is that they are looking. And we hope that in the next iteration of this, that African investigators will be involved. But what we're doing is that we're looking to um, see if we can do in vivo gene editing. This is something that would really mean that rather than go through the process of um, myeloablation that is required for ex vivo gene therapy, when you do in vivo gene therapy, you don't need to have that process. And so that is a technology. It's not there yet, but there's a lot of very, very exciting work that's ongoing. 
final thing that I want to say to answer your question, Gaston, and expand on it a little bit, this is where I think we are um, and the opportunity that H3 Africa, Tanzania Society of, of, of um, Human Genetics and African Society of Human Genetics is, is, um, is very well positioned is with regards to understanding the, the genetic factors that influence erythropoiesis and influence the immune system when it comes to handling both the vector and um, the, the immune reconstitution that comes on, on after um, transplantation as well as after that. There's been safety concerns um, before anybody asked, there's been safety concerns about gene therapy. And this is something that is being taken very, very seriously. Charmaine is here and she may want to talk about that, taken very, very seriously. And this is why we're very lucky that we're working so closely with our patient community. The plan is that um, with the, the genomic capacity that we've developed, we'll be able to answer the questions about erythropoiesis, about um, um, immune reconstitution, about immune um, system um, in response to either the vector or the, um, the, 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 um, the process itself. And so um, we're very excited um, that we will be part of the process. There's a lot of discussion, a lot of support, and um, the cost issue is something that our governments are very much engaged and it's something that we'll be doing. Gaston, if we do not transplant patients in Africa, they will leave and get transplants there. And we've got experience um, from Uganda, um, fantastic work again that's been done by Dr. Francis, Dr. Sisi and others, where they've shown with the cohorts of patients who've gone and received transplants um, outside of, of Ghana, what the survival outcome is. So there's a lot of lesson and a lot of capacity here. I'll stop there, I could talk forever, but thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Yuli. Um, thank you so much for your elaborate answer. Um, um, so um, next, um, perhaps we can focus on a question to Martin. Um, someone was asking anonymously whether gender is a risk factor for iron deficiency anemia, and, and what do we know about that? <clears throat> uh, thanks, Eliza. Thanks to the anonymous question. It's a really great question. Um, Yes, I would say gender is a risk factor to iron deficiency anemia. And it's basically in the life cycle of, um, of, of our, our females, especially. Um, we noted that when um, a child or a young lady becomes an adolescent, um, from that point on, when they start their menses, um, there is heavy bleeding, which in Africa, unfortunately, maybe because of various factors like culture and the like, we have not paid very close attention to that um, uh, population group. And what you see is that uh, that's the first point when they start becoming anemic because of the heavy bleeding. In, other, in the developed world, what you see is that there is access to contraceptives, for example, and to services uh, where, you know, where these young ladies can be guided into what to do, especially if they're having heavy bleeding to counteract the iron loss. So that is also coupled with now the increased rates of early uh, pregnancies in most uh, countries. And therefore you find that by the time the young lady is hitting 15, 16, even sometimes about 18, majority of, um, of, the, majority of country, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa are struggling with um, a lot of teenage pregnancies, a lot of uh, uh, young, the, the, the time of first pregnancy is very early in most of these countries. And then as I explained in my presentation, that uh, kickstarts a vicious cycle of uh, going into pregnancy and that keeps getting um, you know, repeated and repeated over and over again. Now, the young men are not experiencing that. While the young ladies are going through this, the young men are not experiencing this. Instead, um, they are in a period of rapid growth but largely because they don't lose the eye or not unless they you know, bleed or cut themselves, uh, you know, maybe rough spots or something. Um, they don't have this same uh, iron demands that women have during their, their monthly cycles, but also during the heavy uh, uh, demands of iron during the uh, pregnancy period. That is the reason why I would conclude that, yes, there is a gender uh, um, risk factor when you are talking about iron deficiency. Okay, thank you for your answer, Martin. Um, so thank you. Um, so we are a little bit over time, but I would like to ask um, a question to each presenter if possible. So just run a little bit over. Um, so the next one, uh, 
would be for um, Professor Wonkam. Uh, how prevalent is sickle cell disease in North Africa? And are sickle cell risk alleles selected for in admixed people with African ancestry? Sickle cell is, is relatively common, but not as common as, for example, in Tanzania, Congo, or Nigeria. For example, in Nigeria, the frequency in the general population may be up to 25% or in Congo, um, but in North Africa, we expect it to be around 10% in tribal area, but much lower, for example, in urban area. Thank you. Is there uh, admixed population selects for them? The answer is that we do not have any evidence for that. Mm. Uh, what, what we could say is that sickle cell disease is present in the southern part of Italy, is present in uh, Greece. Actually, the first community screening for sickle cell started in Greece uh, some, some years ago. Um, the question that is from evolutionary perspective and migration perspective is when does sickle cell disease arrive in southern part of Europe? So that might be very interesting. What we do know is that in that part of Europe, for example, the most common haplotype is the Benin haplotype. We tend to suggest that uh, the migration and admixture with European in that part of Europe is very recent. Uh, when I say re relatively recent, probably, probably 5,000 years ago, but it's something that we still need to investigate. Thank you. Thank you so much. And lastly, I would like to ask Yvonne, uh, Judith uh, Kumutini is asking how much blood are we talking about uh, to fill the gaps that are seen in the region? And is it um, is importing blood from elsewhere an option? Well, thank you very much for that question. If I got it right, um, how much blood are we talking about? Well, WHO advocates for 100% voluntary blood donations. And so that is what we are aiming for. Um, we are hoping that strategies are somehow being done by the Blood Safe Project, which is being sponsored by NHLBI. Uh, and this is supposed to find strategies to improve blood donation in the sub region. So three countries are involved and they are coming up with very innovative strategies, including um, using communication strategies like WhatsApp messaging, docudramas, um, ion supplementation, which has been done in other countries and not in Africa yet. So we are using interventions that we think will help with our blood donor pool. So definitely, yes, 100% voluntary blood uh, donor pool and maintaining them, retaining these donors. I think that is uh, the most important thing. You can have 100%, but at the end of the day, if you don't retain a lot of them, you haven't really done much. So we need to have them and be able to retain them um, for use. Yeah. And the second question, was there yeah. a second? Yeah, there was a follow-up to that saying whether um, whether blood should be imported to fill those gaps? Um, I think that if we're able to come up with all these interventions and if these interventions help, definitely we would want to use our own. So um, getting blood from somewhere else, I don't think that should be considered as an option. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and in your paper, you, you lay out how, how important it is to strengthen uh, blood transfusion services. Um, so, um, yeah. Okay, so I think um, there are a few more questions still and some coming up in the chat, but we are six minutes over. So in the interim of time, I would like to finish the session now because the conference is still going and there are sessions later on uh, that people have to join. So I would like to thank very much all presenters today for, for being here, um, also for your dedication to, to this project. And, and thank you so much uh, also to all the viewers who join us today. And, and with this, I would like to finish the session. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much, Isa, and thank you, everyone. So we'll just go back um, to Professor Christian Happy, who's chairing this um, this session so that um, we can close um, the, the, we can have the break. Professor Happy, is, is he there? Uh, yes, I'm here. Um, very, very uh, interesting presentation, a very impressive presentations, uh, generally, Julie and uh, Ambrose and all of the presenters. I think you made us all proud, you know, because um, I remember a few years ago when we heard about this kind of talk and the signs, we used to hear other people tell us about sickle cell in Africa. But today we are telling our stories ourselves and then you are and I'm just, I can just be, but just be so proud. And, you know, I, I was telling my, my little son a few, a few days ago that I think, you know, when you grow up, uh, go and do medicine and then and get inspired by Ambrose. Ambrose, I actually, he was speaking at you. I was um, giving a talk and you showed up and I said, look, that's, that's your fire him because I really got impressed. And Julie, and or and eight orders, I think you you really making us proud, and I, I can't stop saying this because anytime I hear and I look at you, I know there is hope for this continent. You know, I, I th things are changing, and then I'm taking I'm thanking all of you for taking the lead. Uh, we've gotten to a point now whereby you know I'm sure there is a lot of excitement out there, and at least I'm, I'm sure a lot of the young people listening to you and listen to all this talk, and you could hear the questions coming. Public and from the audience, and you handle them so well. So I, I, I do think that you know at this moment uh, we are getting to a state where when we look at the uh, curriculum, I'm I'm just making sure that uh, I think we need to have. Um, uh, I, I I just want to thank all of you and then also Yaisa for moderating this session. You know it was really fantastic and so powerful, and uh, with um, the synergy that we see now between. The Lancet and then this group, I think that you're really going to be serving as a platform for advocacy, and then to head to have our voice heard and then louder than than what um, Julia and Ambrose that are leading this young this team are providing out there. So I think really I want to thank everybody for this session, and I, I want to uh, 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 just create the indulgence of people. You know, we went a bit over, but we just want to. I mean, it was because of the excitement that we went over. And really, uh, I, I want to thank everybody. It was such a great session. So at this point, we will have to kind of uh, close here at this moment. Is that correct, Julie? I'm just trying to. I'm yeah. Trying to, yeah. yeah. We, we, we have 20 minutes for to the next session. Yes, we will close here, and then we will have to revert after 20 minutes. And then I really want all of us to really uh, applaud and then uh, um, and clap for this, uh, this, this fantastic team of presenters. I think starting this session, you know, starting this session with, I mean, in great, I mean, in great point here, I'm sure this meeting eventually is going to be something else. And thank the great presenters and then thank Julia and then thank all organizers for making this happen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Christian.